Lord this evening. <clears throat> he who hath ears, let them hear these words. Revelation 9, 1 through 2. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star falling from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. You may be seated. Please turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. There is a expression. I think you probably heard it before. Out of the frying pan and into the fire. That certainly applies tonight. Because we go into Revelation chapter 9, and I call it Unmasking the Devil's Tactics. Let's do a quick review of where we've been so far. Let me first state my disclaimer again. I may be wrong on how I handle the book of Revelation. My interpretation of Revelation is really influenced by one of my early elders that uh, that was kind of his pet project to always teach the book of Revelation. And uh, before, uh, well, actually, before him, uh, Bible professors a little bit, but really most of my understanding of the book of Revelation comes not from a Bible professor, but really from that one elder. My interpretation is based on what was the message for the early Christians, and how can we apply that message to us today? Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. Then in the end of verse 3, for the time, the time is near. I believe the book of Revelation was primarily written for those early Christians so they would know how to handle the greatest persecution that ever came upon the church. And certainly we can apply some lessons to our life today. What have we done so far? Go all the way back to chapter 4. Chapter 4, we was introduced to the great throne room of God Himself. In chapter 5, we, we met the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Chapter 6, God is telling us judgment is coming. We, we encountered the four horsemen and six of the seven seals. You might remember I had you two write down a word. That word is catalysts, because chapter 6, like the whole book of Revelation, is a catalyst to cause all of us to want to reach out to family and friends before it's too late. You see, it's not just a warning to the Christians, hey, persecution is coming, it's a plea. Let's get involved and let's bring people to the Lord before it's too late. Chapter 7, chapter 7, don't worry early Christians, the faithful obedient will be saved. They will win and so do we today. What brought the Roman Empire to its knees? The majority of historians say it was three main factors. Catastrophic natural disasters. And history does tell us that during the Roman Empire, there was a, a definite peak in, in natural disasters. Number two, moral decay. And number three, enemies. There was a laundry list of enemies that Rome had to face virtually almost every year of the empire. Now, chapter 8. Chapter 8, we came up with the 
natural disasters. And we were reminded that prayer, prayer makes the difference. In the face of so-called natural disasters, Christians should continue to pray. Very important. Well, that's the natural disasters. How about the moral decay and the enemies? Well, that's chapter 9. We'll do moral decay tonight, and Lord willing, we'll look at the enemies next Sunday morning. What's the key to understanding the first 12 verses of chapter 9? Here's the key. Be aware of the devil's tactics. Be aware of the devil's tactics. Unmask the devil's tactics, but don't despair. Because God protects his own. In this section tonight, we're introduced to the seduction and I purposely call it the seduction of moral decay. It was several years ago, a jewelry store manager way down in Florida, he decided to buy a, 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 a traveling salesman's a, a display case of Native American silver and turquoise jewelry to put it in his store. Well, in that market, it wasn't selling very well. In fact, it was not selling at all. As he got ready to go on his vacation with his family, he left a note for his staff. The note said, put all of the silver and turquoise Native American jewelry, put it all on half price and sell it. When he got back, all the Native American jewelry was sold. But it didn't happen the way he thought it would happen. His staff misread his note. And instead of halving the price, they doubled the price. And it all sold. Because people would come into the store, they would see that Native American jewelry, and it was up in price, and they thought, well, that must be valuable. So they would buy it. You know, that's a lot like the devil. That's what Satan does all the time. He makes cheap and worthless things seem unbelievably valuable. He flips the price tags. He labels evil good. And a lot of people are deceived. In chapter 9, we're introduced to Satan's deceptions and delusions of moral decay. Verse number one, again. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star. We're going to come back to star here in just a moment. I saw a star falling from the heaven to the earth. To him was given the key. Key to what? The bottomless pit. We'll come back to that also. Notice, this star is already fallen from heaven. The tense of the verb right here indicates something that happened in the past with continuing results. I wonder who that star might be. In other words, the star fell at some time in the past with the result that it remains. He remains in a fallen state. Who is this star? Well, you probably already guessed. Satan. We're talking about Satan. Luke chapter 10, And he, Jesus, said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. If there's any debate, the answer is given to us in verse 11. You'll notice two names right there. Two names given. Both of those names, both of those words mean destroyer who is the destroyer of everything that we call good that's the devil the devil is the destroyer he fell to this earth and his first act as satan was to convince adam and eve that they could be a god like he wanted to be 
You'll be like God, he said, when you eat the forbidden fruit. And it's the lie that he's been telling us ever since. It's a lie. The world says you're full of potential. All you need to do is to actualize the potential within you and you will succeed. But that's not what the Bible says. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing, John 15. We are totally dependent upon God. And yet Satan would have us believe that we can be God's ourselves. The early Christians needed to hear this, and so do we today. We need God. Satan has indeed fallen to this earth, but during the persecution, when the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, Satan was given the keys to the bottomless pit. You see, Satan has no power. Let me emphasize that. Satan has no power other than what he has been given. And he was given the key to this bottomless pit. And Satan has his helpers. 2 Peter chapter 2, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell. Stop right there. This word that's translated in English as hell, that actual word means pit. Pit. He cast them down to hell or cast them down to the pit and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. The pit is a terrible place, <laughs> even for demons. Remember in Luke chapter 8, in Luke chapter 8, verse 31, when Jesus was casting the legion of demons out of the man, what do they beg? They beg Jesus, don't send us into the bottomless pit. It's horrible. Terrible. At this point in Revelation, this holds Satan's worst demons, but when the fifth angel says, his trumpet, Satan is given the key to this pit, and look what happens. Verse 2 and 3. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke. You think about smoke. I remember one year back home in, in Perigal growing up, some of the farmers were burning off their wheat stubble, and suddenly the, the wind changed. And the fire went from a very controlled fire to it was out of control. And now the smoke was actually billowing over the highway. The smoke got so thick that the police on both sides of the smoke had to stop traffic because you couldn't see where you were going. You see, smoke covers up. Satan wants to cover up his moral decay. He wants you to think it's okay. He wants you to think it's not that bad, you know. He wants to draw you down. He wants to bring you down with him. So at this point in Revelation, this pit, the smoke is coming up. It says, the smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. We've got deception, delusion. We've got cover-up. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. And to them were given power as the scorpions of the earth had power. The smoke is the deception and delusion of the devil himself. Because he does not want you to see what really is happening. He wants to draw you away. It's like, you know, you take, a, you take a frog. You take a frog and you touch him into a, a, a pan of, of boiling water. He's going to jump out. Because why? Because the water is hot and he doesn't like that. But if you put a frog in a pan of cold water, and just eventually, just gradually, just slowly turn up the heat. 
you'll have a cooked frog. You see, that's what the devil does. He doesn't want us to realize how deceptive he is. He doesn't want us to realize how bad some of these decisions that we can make morally, how bad some of those decisions can actually be. The locust. What's the locust? Well, you probably guessed this too. The locust is the moral decay that crippled Rome. One of the three reasons for the empire's fall. Two weeks ago, I had the opportunity, had the opportunity to talk to one of our international students that's studying with me. And uh, um, we got talking about locusts. Because his grandfather told him the story when the locusts hit their village when he was a little boy. And you see, locusts is a great metaphor for moral decay. Because, see, you locusts, with locusts, they start off, you know, you don't see the whole swarm at first. They'll send out a few scouts, a few scouts to, uh, to survey the land. And, and you might look up and you might not see anything because there's just a few out there. But they are surveying the land. And, and before you know it, the, the whole swarm comes in. You, you see, with moral decay... We take a step in the wrong direction. And we think, well, we're okay. You know, we're not going to fall victim. And then we take another step in the wrong direction. And then we take another step in the wrong direction, and another step, and pretty soon we're down into the pit of the world. The locust reminds us of the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 10, so Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, you know, they come in slowly. The east wind brought the locusts. What happened, Moses? The locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously there had been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them. Verse 15, For they covered, they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened. Deception, delusion. And they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hell had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees or the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, that, that's literal locusts. Here we've got a symbolic locusts. Like in Egypt, this is a picture of absolute devastation. And that's exactly what happens when Satan's forces are unleashed. Only instead of hurting the trees and the grass like they did in Exodus, the moral decay will hurt the people. Verse 4, they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth. See, this is not your typical locust. Nor anything green. This is not your typical locust. Or any tree but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Remember the 144,000? And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Limited. This is not eternal punishment. This is limited. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, I want you to really notice verse 6. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. Verse 6. The believers, Christians... They're protected from the effect of moral decay. As long as you stay faithful, you're protected. But everyone else will be tormented for five months. This is a limited time. This is not the eternal punishment of hell. This is what? God bringing down His wrath on the Roman Empire. 
In fact, the people, they will hurt so bad they'll want to die. What does historians reveal? Historians reveal that the suicide rates in Rome skyrocketed. skyrocketed. Just what it says here in verse 6. My friends, that's the nature of moral decay. So beware. Moral decay promises so much, but delivers so little. Unmask the devil's tactics. The early Christians, hey, they needed to hear this. And so do we. Joe Guterres wrote a book about his 42 years as a steel worker. In the book he talked about at night, he said it was so pretty. They'd be working there on the steel mill and they would look up into the cooling structures and you could see those real pretty little silver flakes floating down through the air. And people thought it was so, so pretty. What was those silver flakes? Abestus. Abestus. The people who worked in that factory, almost all of them are now suffering from the slow, choking grip of abestus poisoning. Here's what he said in that book. He said, who am I? I'm everybody. I can't walk too far now. I get tired real fast and it hurts when I breathe. And, and to think, we used to fight over getting that job. Folks, that's like the devil. How many things in our culture resemble the silver flakes in that steel mill? They're enchanting, they're beautiful, but they're deadly. Deadly. That's the way it is with the devil's lies. His delusions and deceptions will eternally kill you. Verse 7 and 8. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They look good. It looks pretty, beautiful, gold. They had hair like women's hair. And their teeth were like lion's teeth. Wow. Kind of a pretty picture there. You know, the devil's deceptions, they do look pretty. They look very pretty. I believe every person that I have worked with that was dealing with any type of addiction, alcohol, drugs, pornography, you name it. They all say, you know, it starts off, it looks so good. It looks so pretty. It looks so enticing. It is so, what, tempting. In some ways, Satan's deceptions are attractive creatures, but they're very cruel. Verse 9 and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was what? To hurt men five months. Once again, this is limited. This is not eternal punishment. This is limited. That's the devil. They will inflict an incredible amount of pain, as we've already seen. Put it all together. These deceptions of the devil are locust-like, they're horse-like, they're man-like, they're lion-like, they're scorpion-like creatures. Let's sum it all up. It all adds up to one hideous, grotesque hordes of beings, and that's exactly what God wants to communicate here. My friends, sin is awful. The early Christians, they needed to hear this. And so do we today. Satan and his forces are at last revealed for what they really are. God says, I want you to know what they really are. They're not nice spirit guides. They're not the warm light at the end of the tunnel. 
They're not your Uncle Joe come back from the dead. Unmasked, they are hideous, horrifying creatures that will absolutely destroy you in the end. Verse 11, And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. Both of those names mean destroyer. Destroyer. Satan. Satan is what? He is a destroyer who brings destruction into every life he touches. When Barry Merritt and his family to St. Petersburg, Florida, he thought, I'll take my kids down to the beach and they'll get to play in the water. But he found out that in that area of Florida that uh, there's a problem. There's a lot of uh, jellyfish that get into the water. There's a lot of stingrays that are pretty close to the, to the beach. And you've got to be real careful. So he was always on pins and needles trying to protect his children. Some friends had a boat. They invited him and his family to go out on the boat and go out uh, uh, about two or three miles out and go to an island out there in the Gulf. And they would, you know, have fun. It was uh, pretty much an abandoned island. There wasn't nobody there. And they would have just a big old time. It wasn't until he mentioned to his fellow co-workers where they were going that he found out the truth. They were actually going to an area that's one of the number one areas for sharks. He went out of the frying pan into the fire. A much worse situation for his children. My friends, wake up to the devil's tactics. He makes the wrong look so beautiful. That island and the water around the island looks so good. But it can be very destructive. So beware, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, don't be afraid. Be aware of what the devil can do and fortify yourself against him. We know what to expect. The early Christians knew what to expect and we do also. God has unmasked the devil deceptions and his delusions so we can be where now did you notice that the 144,000 are protected obedient faith in Jesus protects us from the moral decay that's offered by the devil so what do we need to do number one we need to be obedient and we need to live faithful lives to protect us from the tactics of the devil. John 17, I do not pray that you should take them, speaking of, the, uh, of uh, the apostles, that you should take them out of the world, that you should keep them from the evil one. Yes, we've got to live in this world, but we need to be prepared for what the devil can do, and we need to know how to fight him. James chapter 4. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He will flee from you. Are you resisting? Do you have the tools necessary to resist? We need to be aware of Satan's tactics, we don't, but we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be wringing our hands because why? Our Heavenly Father protects those who are His. Always. The early Christians, they needed to hear this. And so do we today. That picture there was on the front cover of Sports Illustrated. Donnie, you probably recognize this guy. Frank Hall, back on February the 27th, 2012, about 10 years ago, a student, 17-year-old T.J. Lane, he burst into his high school cafeteria with a loaded weapon. He started gunning down classmates. He pretty quickly killed three. He would have killed more if it hadn't been for Coach Hall. 
Coach Hall, you know, he describes himself as a big teddy bear. You know, he's not a guy that's going to hit somebody. He's not a guy that is violent. He's like a big old teddy bear. But when he saw TJ with the gun, he took the initiative. He started running to that young man, and he started screaming, no, no, no. TJ, he panicked. He turned around and started running out. When the police, when the police, excuse me, when the police finally found T.J. Lane on a wooded road, he was shivering and wearing a T-shirt with the word killer on it. When they asked him why he ran away, he said, because Coach Hall was chasing me. Here's a quote from Coach Hall. I know it sounds crazy, but in all honesty, I really didn't think about anything. I just reacted. As a society, we cannot lose our outrage when these kinds of tragedies happen. Furthermore, he said, we can't just get to the point where we accept these kinds of things as just part of our lives now. We have to make sure that we as a people don't accept it. We can't. Coach Hall is absolutely right. We cannot accept the moral decay that Satan is throwing at us these days. It's worse than I've ever seen in my lifetime. We can't accept it. We cannot. We have to make a stand, especially we who know Jesus. We cannot cower in fear anymore. Instead, let's charge the gates of hell in the power of Jesus' name and know that they will not prevail against us. I believe we can still make a difference. Is our country the country that I grew up as a little boy in Greene County, Arkansas? No. Our country has dramatically changed for the worse. But I believe that we as Christians can still make a difference. Amen? Amen. The early Christians, they needed to hear this. And so do we today. Are you a Christian? Are you making a difference? Do you believe? Will you repent? Will you confess? Will you be baptized? As a Christian, do you need to seek forgiveness? The church stands ready to pray with you and for you. How about it? We can make a difference if we are a faithful Christian. Are you a faithful Christian tonight? If there's anything that we could do for you tonight, will you please come as we stand and sing for your encouragement. Jesus is tenderly calling you.